stuff of stuff that you can find that you can find on Google. But if you don't know how to apply it, you don't know if you need to apply it, uh, then it doesn't do you much good. So let's let's get your topics on the board. Let's talk to those specifically and tailor this to you. And again, it's not a lecture. I know I'll be doing all the talking, answering questions and giving information, but it needs to be a conversation again to tailor these, these data points and these informational uh, subjects specifically to how you can use them. Because all of you are in a different walk of life. I know we have construction companies, we have IT companies, we have companies of all walks of life. And I, I would say 99% of the time we can find a way to fit what you do into some form of a government contract in some shape or form. But we got to get through the basics first. All right, who am I? This is simply where I come from in the contracting world. And the reason I put this up there is because I'm not an encyclopedia that's just black and white. Where I'm going to come from is my time in the 22 years in the military writing contracts. How did I look at evaluating vendors like you? What information did I need you to show me? What made you stand out amongst your peers or your competitors? How did I use two or three of you to work together to create a better contract to serve my customer in the government? So some of the things I'm gonna present, I'll just give you my opinion. A lot of this is my opinion on how I did it in the government and what I expected of a company. Once I retired, I said, well, let me flip the script. I'm gonna to sell to the government. Well, now I'm in your chair, I'm in your shoes. Now I have to figure out how to be that person and do what I expected from the government side. So now we're gonna talk about the perspective of we're a small business now. We don't have the huge capital. We don't have the personnel, the resources, and we don't have the time. So resources is gonna be a critical key point. Your resources of personnel, money, and time are gonna be extremely important to how you enter into contracting with the government, how aggressively you go at it, and how much time you put in. Because if you put in a lot of time and it's not really producing the return on your investment, well, then it's, it's not worth your time. You should be doing something else. Or we need to adjust how you're, you're proceeding to get the best return on your investment of your time and resources. And most of you I know, are just a single person company. You're doing a passion that you love. You're in a field that you love. And eventually you're gonna be in the office more and more and more doing things that you don't love, just so you can try to get a contract to do the, the one thing that you're passionate about, right? So there's a balance there. And we need, to, we need to realize that up front because the government contracting world is a complex environment and it starts to really tax your resources and it really taxes your time. So it's hard for you to be there and do eight hours of paperwork, but it's supposed to be out there doing eight hours of the work that you do at the same time, right? So there, there is a, a definite growth scale that I wanna to talk to you about so that you're prepared because the government doesn't want you to fail. They want you to succeed. You don't wanna fail and you don't wanna get yourself into a position where now you have more pain and stress because there is a promise of contracting is easy and it's an endless flow of revenue. I'm going to give you from a small business owner, hey, here's the realities of the situation. Consider this. And it's it's not meant to be negative uh, and it's not meant to be positive either. It's just, it's a neutral what it is, how it works in the system. Then I'm going to give you the perspective of where I work now. I'm the contracting officer for a defense contractor out of Oahu, which is a much larger business than my own private business, and how we tackle with greater resources. We have more people that I can rely on. I have more technical folks. I have more money available. I have a larger picture of a forecast that I need to work on, right? So it's, it's taken it from the government perspective down to the small one-person perspective, but then I can see it from years down the line as your company grows where will you be sitting as we as we as you've grown 
And now you have many government contracts and you have more work under your belt and more work coming down the pipeline. How do you prepare for that? So that's me. Uh, at the bottom, you'll see my LinkedIn. Uh, feel free, you'll get these slides at the end. Uh, feel free to link up with me on LinkedIn. Uh, as you know, Marla's email at the bottom. If you have questions or afterwards really need to get a hold of me, you can always go through Marla and she can get in contact with me to get your questions answered. Uh, I'm definitely here for your success. Uh, this is something that we love to do. Uh, Gold Wings is a Hawaiian woman-owned business, uh, so it's a very important to us to give back to the community. Um, and so I, I definitely have a vested interest in your success. So part one, there's not a whole lot to part one. This is meant to be just, uh, it, was, it was designed as a one hour you know, conversation with the company. And let's, let's talk about the procurement landscape, right? You know, really kind of give you a picture of really what, what is that world look like? You know, I, I hear many times that people say that, you know, hey, government contracting is for these big Boeing and Lockheed's and L3 and these big communications companies. They're the ones who do, do government contracts. <clears throat> but the reality is government contracts are at every scale across the board. And it's fully free and open for you to participate. So we'll take a look at the entities there. Um, you know, I'll touch on the, the FAR. The FAR is the, the Bible of the government, right, for the federal government. And the, the state, counties, municipalities, they all have a book, right? They have some type of rule book. And there, there's a, a funny component to their books. It doesn't tell them how to do the contracting. It just tells them what they can't do, what they aren't supposed to do, what they're not allowed to do. But the rest of it is a creative process, right? So it there is ability to do things by thinking outside the box. And with my experience, what I'll do is during every topic of conversation, I will share with you kind of some of those outside the box ways of thinking. And I'll give you some examples. And some of these are really, really, you know, innovative and you go, wow, that works. Well, the government didn't say you can't do it. So why, why not do it? Right. And, you know, there's, there's even a simple example of most people understand that in the general contracting world, the government puts out a solicitation. They're going to require something. They, they put it out for bid. You bid on it. Well, there's also unsolicited proposals. If you have an idea and you want to share it with the government, they don't have to ask for it at all. You can just go to them and say, I have this. I can do this for you. I can improve your process. Would you consider me? And that works. It's it's possible to do that. I'll talk a little bit about thresholds uh, because money is a key component when you enter this world. Uh, money is a key component in general when you run your business. We'll look at what, what levels the government operates at and how those requirements affect you because at certain thresholds, the, the pain factor increases substantially and so at other levels that we'll talk about in a minute you won't even know that the opportunities are out there so that means we need to work a little bit harder on finding the opportunities that you can't see in a public posting and that's where we talk about micro purchase and the government purchase company all right so i can read all of your minds right now and everyone is saying this stuff, I've been reading it on Google, I've been researching, I've gone to 100 classes, and it's really overwhelming. It is just a lot of complex, overwhelming stuff. I don't understand half of it, or even if I'm supposed to be reading this, what, what are we doing? All right, so I'm not going to give you 50 slides on more information. I'm going to tell you that it's overwhelming by design. If you think about government agencies, no matter if they're at the county or your state level, even a university that does, you know, does purchasing, and then 
the top of the food chain, you know, the federal government, it's somebody's taxpayer dollar, right? So when we look at taxpayer money, which is your money that you paid in your taxes, the government has a responsibility to protect your money. And the only way to protect your money is to make a system that is so hard, so redundant, has so many checks and balances, and is intentionally slow. It is very slow. It is very cumbersome, very technical. And that's to prevent spillage of taxpayer money going to the wrong places, fraud, you know, those kinds of things. The government's doing their best to protect your money that you give them and to make it used as efficiently as possible, right? So it's overwhelming, but it's supposed to be. So we'll go back to slide one and we'll say, well, let's not try to absorb all of this at once. Let's just take it one bite at a time, one step at a time. Let's just focus on what we can learn right now for the next steps and then grow your library of knowledge over time. We're not gonna jump right into getting a contract and executing, that's down the road. We've gotta get a whole bunch of this overwhelmingness settled, get our situational awareness to expand, right? And then really start seeing how the pieces are moving together, the risks, you know, and what risks you can mitigate, how can you get ahead of the curve? You know, there's, there's people that go, hey, I bid on 50 contracts. I never won a single one. As soon as, as soon as I saw it, I put in a bid. Well, there's probably people that knew that contract was coming out three months ago. They've already done more homework, more research, more supplier involvement. They've read more about it. So they were better prepared. So that's what we're talking about is let's learn about being better prepared. And then we'll get into the world of, of winning these contracts. I can also read your mind and everybody's sitting there saying, hey, this is all great, but what do I do next? Honestly, I just need to know what the next step is. I got all this information. I'm at this point. Would somebody please help me out, look at my situation and tell me what is the next step? So that's where I want to go. I'm not into this big, massive information fire hose. Why don't we just look at your companies and with 90 or 80 or however many people are online, we're going to have to generalize it a little bit, but many of those steps at this point in your journey are similar and you'll know that, hey, here's the next step. Now I have some homework. And as you do each one of those steps, you're going to learn a lot more. You're going to open your eyes to more information and you're going to start getting these blocks laid on the path to your next contract. This is through the YWCA. So my take on the way that I am presenting has a focus on women-owned business and women-owned small business certification. Uh, the next slide, I'll, I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about. So let's talk about certifications. Small business certifications start with the word small business. Small business is, and we'll talk about later, categorized by your industry, and then we'll, we'll work through that. But generally speaking, most of you are all, you're going to be in the small business category. Small business is now subdivided by the federal government. This doesn't necessarily apply to state and local and universities and other entities. Generally speaking, we are in the world of federal government conversation right now. Federal government being the most complex of contracting, the Small Business Administration, and you can find on their site, about six or eight different uh, small business classification set-asides. That's when the government can set aside this acquisition for your socioeconomic category. If we look at how the government uh, enforces that, it's not necessarily a requirement, 
that they set it aside for a woman-owned small business, a veteran-owned small business, a hub zone business. It's a goal. And so they set a goal, a percentage of dollars spent for agencies to go to your business. Now they're not required to, just because there is uh, small businesses in the women-owned small business category that exist, the government does not have to set that acquisition aside just for a women-owned small business. And from my opinion, on the government side, in reality, they're filters. So I can filter it down to each of those categories. But if I filter down too much, then I don't get enough competition, right? And so if I bring that filter up one level to small business and I get a woman owned small business and say that woman is a veteran owned small business also, I still get the credit for both. So what we see in the government landscape today is that the better competition, the better documentation on the government side, you know, more robust bids with better pricing is coming at the small business level. And generally speaking, they're getting their, they're getting the women owned, they're getting the service disabled owned, they're getting all the categories anyways at that small business level. So I'll never say don't get your socioeconomic certifications. You should because it opens doors, it opens opportunities. But I would also say, evaluate the time and resources it takes to get those opportunities or those socioeconomic certifications and how it's being used in the government. So if we take some time and re reverse engineer it, well, let's go look at what the government's buying now in what you do. And let's see how many of those opportunities in your specialty were ever set aside for a socioeconomic status. Many times you're going to find they were all set aside for small business. They don't use your socioeconomic status for your line of work because there's a, a, a plenty, there's plenty of competition at the small business level. They don't need to refine it any further. And they don't want to refine it any further because now they eliminate some of the folks that they like to, to work with. When it comes to the woman owned small business certification, if you go through that process and you get that, that's a good thing. It'll open the door. However, don't be under the impression that the government's going to come running to you knocking at your door with a briefcase of money saying, we have all this work we need done. Thank God you got your certification. I think we're all real and realistic in that it doesn't necessarily work that way. We still have to do it the old fashioned way, whether it's set aside or not, you still have to put together a quality proposal. You have to be able to do a quality job and you have to do all the invoicing and documentation and everything that goes along with you know, receiving a contract. It's, it's not a free ticket that they're just gonna issue it to you. That eliminates all the pain. You go out, do what you do, and the money's waiting for you. It's, the certifications don't eliminate the old fashioned process, okay? And so to back that up a little bit and, and to make the news even, even better, the federal government only requires these agencies to have a goal of a woman-owned small business uh, percentage. And so if we look at the right column, where it talks about women-owned small business, the current goal is 5% for these agencies. And that's the only agencies that are required. So 5% of their money needs to go to women-owned small businesses but again, if we back up one filter level, if we look at prime contract small business goals, they're pretty high already. So they're going to be pushing in your category as a small business. And when you have that set aside as a small business, you win a contract, they're going to get the women-owned small business credit anyways. So that just, I just want to show you that, you know, 
and this goes back to my my third category that I'm in defense contracting. I'm a I work for a woman owned small business. We are hub zone A A. We have everything. Generally speaking, we get most of our contracts, almost all of them, under a small business set aside, or even full and open where they don't even set the the contract aside. They go wide open against the big businesses. So with that. Let's move Can I on to the question. Go ahead. So we have a question from uh, in chat from Charlie. Um, I'm not sure if I'm translating this correctly, but government contracting for this WOSB SD VOSB has found the best way to get into the door of government contracting is subcontracting to large businesses and no support from government. Is there anything such as protection? the government can assist us with working with large businesses. So um, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. Maybe Charlie, you can, um, you can. Uh, so I've got, I, I got most of it. I can talk to most of it. Um, yes. So when we talk about advanced strategies, uh, that is going to be one of the early on strategies uh, that, and I, I guess I should clarify that. When we talk about you doing business with the government, um, it's kind of everybody under, has an understanding that, okay, I have to go at it alone and I'm gonna go up, read the solicitation and bid on the contract. It really depends on your what your field of work is. Uh, so for instance, uh, one of the clients we had uh, in Hawaii has a coffee farm. And, and it's a perfect example. The government doesn't solicit for simply coffee. When the government, the way they, they do their contracts is they will have a list of consumables. So it'll be paper plates, forks, napkins, coffee, tea, sugar, et cetera, et cetera. And the coffee farmer can't bid on that contract because they can't provide everything else. So in their situation, they have to be a subcontractor. They're better off selling to the primes or working at educating themselves on who are the prime contractors winning these contracts. So I can go work with them and partner. The beauty about starting as a subcontractor is you get some exposure, you get some experience to the contract world, but you get paid right away from the prime. You're not dealing with all the systems, right? You're not dealing with waiting 30 to 60 days to get paid. You're doing what you do. You work under that prime. The prime deals with the government and you have a good deal. You're going in as a team. And that's what I was saying is from my government perspective, if I have a really good person here, but I don't solicit that way, I don't buy what they sell or what they their service in that individual manner. For instance, if you're a chapel assistant, well, I may not put out a chapel assistant. I may put out a personal services contract and I may list chapel assistants, cafeteria assistants, right? different human resource categories under one larger offering. And what you'll need to do as a chapel assistant is get educated on who's getting the overall contract and work under them as a subcontractor. And if what you'll see on that chart that I have up here, this is only a portion of the chart. The first half of the categories, you see it says prime, prime, prime. The second half of this sheet is all subcontract goals. So I think maybe to answer your question where we talk about protection, the government can assist with working with large businesses. The government requires the large businesses to have subcontract goals in certain situations to where they are gonna actually look for you to have certain certifications or be a small business, be able to understand what you have to do, let's say just paperwork wise to sign subcontracts and be able to perform their overall contract as a team member. Same with construction. A construction company generally won't have every, every one of the trades, they won't have an HVAC inherently in their company. They won't have electrician, 
the plumber. They won't have all the different trades. They have to subcontract the roofing, the the wastewater, the electrician, the environmental, right? So many times a construction contractor will be the prime, but they're putting together a team, but they need to have a team that are like situated as small businesses, right? And, and so those are things that, yes, to answer your question, the subcontracting is an excellent, excellent route to take. But in that world too, that's a compartmentalized subject that we need to talk to, you know, at, at, a, at another time or a certain time. Let's look at, you know, what are the nuances in subcontracting? But yeah, I think that's, that answers it. The government does require on the other half of this chart, subcontracting to be set aside as well for small business. Charlie had a second part to her question, which is large businesses use our certifications to help get contracts. Great, but what if they don't use us as agreed? And so in, in this situation, um, part of the question doesn't count because if they don't use you, they have to use somebody else that also has the certification. The con the large cannot get the contract by listing you as a woman-owned small business or whatever the uh, status is. They can't use that to win without utilizing you. They would have to have utilized somebody else that had the same certification. Does that make sense? Hopefully. And here's a little tidbit when we talk about subcontracting. There is a socioeconomic status called a DBE. You may have heard of it. That applies to the Department of Transportation. So that's a Department of Transportation program, and they typically will put a 10 or 15% mandatory requirement for a prime contractor to use subcontracted disadvantaged business enterprises. But again, that requirement only lives in the Department of Transportation. So if what you do doesn't apply to DOT, probably doesn't do you a whole lot of good to get a, a DBE certification. Likewise, with the Veterans Administration, they have the service disabled, veteran owned small business certification. Typically, the only people using that certification is the Department of Veterans Affairs. The rest of the government and anything outside of federal doesn't really use it. And that's a pretty robust application to get through to get your veteran owned certification. And then, you know, I'm a perfect example. This is now the second category, small business. I get, I'm a disabled veteran. I go get my certification, but I'm selling to the County of Hawaii. I'm not even bidding on veteran affairs contracts. So the resources I put into my service disabled certification for four or six years now, I've never even used it. I don't bid on those contracts. So it, it, it didn't really benefit me. And, and what I learned from that was, why don't I balance out my resources, again, reiterating what we talked about in the beginning, to the return on investment that that certification is going to give me. If it, it sounds good. I mean, all of the certifications, they're always broadcast to sound great, but we really need to walk through, in my opinion, walk through the return on investment for a certification. Otherwise, you're already certified as a small business based on your NAICS code and your, your industry classification. Press on. Let's go with small business. If you feel like getting the other ones, I'll never say anything about not getting it. Go for it. It may open a door one day. It may lead to another path of revenue. Uh, that's what they're there for. I would just advise put a little more thought into it before expending resources because what I found in my small business was resources at the point you're at where you're a one woman band, a one person, a small family company, your resources are extremely limited at this point 
And before you tax them any further, spend a little time uh, educating yourself on really how they're used and how they can benefit you if they can. Bill, okay, another question. How do you become a subcontractor for these projects? It sounds like you need to be approached by the larger contractor to be part of the team. Not necessarily true. That's, I'm gonna put some notes on here for our chalkboard, ladies and gentlemen. Subcontracting. All right, so I like to, I do this a little differently than most briefings. I know you're taking notes, but I'm gonna take notes with you and then you get the slides at the end of it and it can remind you about our conversation and the different questions that were asked. And so we'll have some of the stuff. I'm, I'll post some links up here as we go if we need to. But anything we want to put on the on the note page, on the chalkboard, we're going to do that together. So how do you become a subcontractor for the projects? Okay. Great question. And I could talk a whole hour alone on probably this subject. So some of you that have worked with me in the past, you know that when we first started talking about getting your business established, one of the key points I put out there is like, like uh, so who can see you? Are you, to answer your question, you need to be, if you need to be approached by a large contractor, are you approachable? Are you able to tell me how a large contractor can find you? If you can't, well then, I'll tell you the next step you need to do right now. Here's your homework. It's going to be called DSBS. And some of you have worked with me. You've looked at it and you go, oh, I get it. Okay. So this is the SBA website for, what is it? Dynamic Small Business. Here we go. The keyword search. If you've registered in SAM earlier than a year or so ago, at the end of SAM, you may remember it said, fill out your small business profile, right? And then it took you to a kind of a, it looks old. It looks like an older based website. And then you filled out some information and then went back to SAM and moved on where the government looks, where companies look. This is a publicly accessible website. This has, you can type in anything you want, state, uh, NAICS code, you can type in keywords and it pops up businesses that are available that are small businesses, their socioeconomic statuses. It's This is the phone book of small businesses, right? This is your yellow pages, right? And this is how people find you, government and private. The, the key component to getting your small business profile right is your, here, here, we're going to make it in bold, capabilities narrative, right? When this list pulls up and it pulls up 50 companies and all that is blank, all they see is a list of companies. Now, they may want to shoot out a spam to all those and go, are you interested? But if your capabilities narrative is clean, concise, it tells what you do, what certifications you have, what your offer and your capacity is, you know, it, it just gives me a good uh, cliff note on your company. I'm probably going to reach out to you first and say, all right, you look like you've got your, your company out there. You're ready to work. I have a project. Would you like to read it? And in just this DSBS area alone, you will start to increase your visibility, you know, a thousand percent. That's, that's where we look. And I would say 90% of the companies I worked with in the past couple months for a quick one-on-one -on -one session, 
The first place I looked was their SAM registration. I get their cage code. I looked in here and about 90% of them had no capabilities narrative. I could not tell what they did by the name of their company and their address. I need to know what you do. And that's a, and keep that updated. You can update it, log in, it's your profile. Always keep that up to date. And what do we have here in the chat? How do we locate or ask for a micro purchase simplified acquisition procedure opportunities? All right, well, let's go back to that. I'm happy to jump around. I love jumping subjects. And if you guys want to come back and talk more about your small business profile, just throw it in the chat. Okay, let's get back on track to the uh, procurement landscape. And the last major subject that we were talking about is acquisition thresholds. So with acquisition thresholds, the amount of the money, the amount of money the government is going to spend on this purchase, this service, this construction, this acquisition that they're going to use determines the, the procedures that they use, and it's going to determine the pain factor on your end to propose on it, right? So when we go above $250,000, which is simplified acquisition, anything below 250K, the government says, realistically, that's not a whole lot of money. Let's just get rid of all the really heavy lifting because the return on investment really isn't there for them to really dig into your company and pricing and data and all this for a simple 250K purchase. Micro purchase is $10,000. So if you see on here, phone call, email, or GSA advantage, this is how the government under $10,000, because that's a really small amount of money, how they can make a purchase. So they can just email you directly and go, hey, we think this is going to be about $6,000 to, to do this small project or the small equipment that you sell. Um, can you give me a quote? You give them a quote and they just issue you a purchase order, right? But again, how do they find you? How do they know about you, right? So we'll, we'll hold that thought. We'll get back. It all, it all ties together. It's like a spider web. Every piece of contracting, when the government's in the center and it sends out one band, it links to another band and that band links around and it all comes back together. So this is a big complex, overwhelming spider web in the face at the same time. So we'll work through it. All right, I'm going to go back up, make sure I answered all that. Uh, micro purchase, simplified acquisition procedures. All right, so micro purchase. Whoops. Micro purchase is um, when we, there's, there's another subcategory to that. Whereas if it's a supply, anything under $2,500, now they're using a credit card. So now they're not even really doing any real homework out there they're going to call you up and say hey i need five hundred dollars worth of nuts and bolts and i'm going to put it on a credit card just like they're shopping at a store right none of that stuff gets posted out there that's all direct direct buying at the lower dollar levels so if that's kind of the world you want to start in right what we do is we say all right all this other really big crazy wild information let's put that on hold let's focus on one bite at a time learning the micro purchase learning that i want to do everything under ten thousand dollars i sell small stuff small scale or i'm a very niche market let's work on that one of the one of the main components that we'll get into later on in the series is 
making that determination up front. Um, kind of the dollar value that you're interested in. Your work may be small or your work may be larger dollar stuff that you're always going to be rolling in the 100,000, could be a million. You know, some of the companies I consult, they said, hey, I don't want anything under 25 million. That's just, we don't have the time to mess with it. We want the big stuff, right? So there's a, there's a, a, a point in your time working in government contract and you need to determine where do I want to be at? Where can I afford to be at? But that has to be a continuous question throughout your growth because at some point, $500 credit card contracts aren't going to be worth your time. You're too busy doing $50,000, $75,000, $150,000 contracts, and you need to focus your resources there. Right. Okay, we got a question. What do we got? When they ask that you must give a prevailing wages to your employees in the job, uh, the question is, um, where do we find what the prevailing wages are? Um, so I think it's called prevailing wage rates. And... is a table. So to answer your question, where where do we find the prevailing wages? Number one, where you find them is in your contract. So in every contract, the government is required to, as part of the contract, pull the prevailing wage rates uh, down from the government and post them in the contract. And I think maybe with a quick Google search, you can find labor. It's gonna be in a labor site. I think it's dol.gov. The Department of Labor every year or maybe multiple times a year will estab establish prevailing wage rates. Um, and that's good information to talk about uh, for those of you in service contracts. So let's let's back up a second and bring some basic information into here. There are commodities. Services and construction. And this is a great subject because part of your entry level into this government contracting thing is understanding what are the categories of contracting and what category do you fit in? Because the rules are different for each of these three categories. One clarification, Bill. Um, so they will not give the wage table when they post the contract. It will be after you are awarded and receive a contract. Don't quote me on 100%, but I'm 99% sure that it's in the solicitation. It is one of the attachments in the solicitation. It will tell you. And the reason I say that is because they're going to call out the specialties they believe are going to be required for that work. And they will give you the appropriate tables so that you can understand the wage rates. However, there are also, and I know the question's coming from a construction company. So that's, that's a little more clear cut. Whereas if it's a service that's not construction, just a pure service, say janitorial service, um, they may ask you to determine what specialties are needed, right? They're not going, the government does not want to have to tell you every inch of everything to do. They go, hey, I've got hundred bathrooms, 12 hallways and 16 offices, 21 garbage cans, fix it. And you go, okay, well, I can do that with three laborers, one supervisor and, you know, whatever, two chemical specialists. It's so that's that's upon you to educate yourself on wage rates that you employ. 
when you're ready to submit your your pricing to the government. And that's important because this will this will go down the line into our series and even beyond when we talk about proposal writing. Uh, proposal writing becomes complex in that you don't want to rush that process, put in a proposal, and now you're not making money. And you've got yourself in a position that you put a price out there. It costs a lot more to do the work that you're getting paid. And you have to put your hands up and say, I can't do it. The road from that point on is now a very rough road because you've lost that credibility in the government of common business acumen when you put in your proposal, right? And you don't wanna also be so naive at doing that proposal and you're throwing these huge numbers out there thinking, oh, the government pays you billions. I'm gonna clean the toilet and get a million dollars a day because they're just gonna keep throwing you out of the running because you, you're unrealistic pricing. You're, you're just trying to overprice with this false sense that the government just has in those deep pockets and it won't work, right? There, there's a realistic people looking at the numbers and even the whole, I wanna get my foot in the door. So I'm gonna lowball this thing. I'm gonna cut the knees right off of everybody and put this ridiculous low price in there. Well, I may throw you out anyways, because now I don't think you understand my requirement. Now I think your price is too low. You missed something. You didn't read everything. You're, there's no way. It doesn't make sense. And, and something to do about, you know, for homework here on this subject of pricing, that's just, I think, would be semi-interesting reading on that perspective. Is research the independent The independent government estimate. And there's a little there's a little behind the scenes to this too. The independent government estimate is the government's job to figure out what the pricing is supposed to be before they put out a solicitation. So they know if you're in the ballpark or if you're trying to charge too much, too little, right? They're supposed to have an idea. All right, here's the secret. Many times the independent government estimate is derived by getting an informal quote from you. It's not supposed to work that way. They're supposed to take their time and do their homework. But a lot of times governments undermanned, they know what they want. They know who they want. They just, hey, give me a quote. And you're like, okay. And later on, you're like, well, I gave you a quote for this. Why are why are you soliciting for it now? I already give you a quote. Well, you didn't. What you did was you gave them informal market research, which is something to think about. When the government comes to you and they go, "Hey, here's a problem. Give me a bit. Give me a quote," and it's not a formal request for quote, you may be doing their homework for them. You may be putting a lot of time, energy, and resources into developing a solution. And they take that, they post it on the internet and all kinds of people bid on a solution that you created, right? So there's a little bit of thought into this. Hey, the government wants my work. They may be just doing market research and you may be giving them the answer that gives your competitor the advantage, right? So just food for thought that the independent government estimate is, uh, is what the pricing is gonna be based on. So your pricing, when you give them the meat to their IGE, uh, maybe just actually displaying your pricing to your competitors. So just be careful with that. If you got questions, wanna get into it deeper, let's talk about it. Um, and then we can, we can help you understand the different requests from the government. Okay, so I think we're caught up on questions. Where were we at? On, okay, and we talked about the thresholds. Again, with your, your dynamic small business search, this is 
many times where these smaller dollars questions will come from because they're going to say, hey, I'm in this state or this island or I'm in this area. I need somebody that can come out and do a quick plumbing repair. All right. Well, generally speaking, you should be in SAM, right? Even if it's not federal, be in SAM. You'll understand how your company registers and works with government agencies. When it comes to your individual state, your counties, your universities, your school systems, whatever, take the time to research who those agencies are and be pre-registered in their systems. So going back to the question of how do you get found for the small micro purchase, be registered in your state acquisition purchasing system or your county purchasing system or as many as you can, and they will look in their own system many times first and go, all right, what plumbing contractors or whatever contractor is already registered? They're already, I think in Hawaii, they call it compliant. Who's already compliant? Who's ready to go? Who can I just issue a purchase order to right now? So being registered in those systems is a part of your homework of what is your next step? Okay, great question. Advantage of an RFP opposed to an RFQ. RFP is a proposal. RFQ is a quote. Essentially, when I ask for an RFQ, it's most likely firm fixed price, probably a commodity or a supply. I just need a quote. There's nothing more to than just line items, part numbers, equipment, or small services where remove and install. A proposal, I'm going to ask for more information. I need you to tell me how you're going to do the job, most likely a service. I need you to be able to meet certain criteria. Proposals are you proposing your solution to meeting the the solicitation requirement, whereas a quote, generally one or multiple pages of flat pricing. And that's the only difference. They're just used in different acquisition requirements. Supply generally, this is service, generally speaking. Okay. I'm ready for more questions. Let's go back and look at did and I think somebody mentioned capability statement up in the chat. Um, I'll I think we talk about that later on in the series, but the capability statement, you uh, most of you have heard it. Most of you are going, ah, okay, I'll do it. I'll get around to it. And what's my format? Okay, well, let's let's dig into capability statements now and later. That's your business card for your company. It's a single sheet. I just want to call at, out one more question, Bill. Sorry to interrupt. Um, yep. So is it best to take advantage of RFP opposed to RFQ? Yep, we answered that right here. You take you you take advantage of both of them. One is just for service and one is for supply. What is the best practice of the government countries? Okay, let me ask for a little bit of clarification. When you say customer, you're talking about the internal government customer? So generally speaking, um, okay, let me, I'm just going to lay out the simple process and hopefully to answer your question. The contracting offices that perform the contracting, perform the solicitations, the bid reviews, and the pricing, they put the package together. That's all they do. They are a, they're a compartment that just does paperwork. The, all the customers that they service 
have to come to them with a requirement. Contracting doesn't design requirements. They don't determine requirements. All they do is process the transaction between the government and the, the companies that are providing that service. So I could have a, uh, say the local police department, they need, uh, they need equipment and office supplies. Well, they're just going to go to their contracting purchasing office and go, hey, I need this list of equipment. I need holsters, hats, buckles, and badges. Here's the specs. And then contracting takes that requirement, puts it out, gets a vendor, gets the stuff, and then it gets delivered to the police department. So the standard process is there is no requirement until the the using agencies go to contracting and ask for some purchase of a equipment supply or construction. Another question, can't an RFQ uh, be for market research as well? Typically, no. Uh, market research would be an RFI. Uh, RFQ should end with an award. Um, for market research, two ways. The smaller stuff, the requiring agency is required to do their own market research and bring it to contracting because contracting never has enough people to do homework for everybody they service. So it's the civil engineering unit that's doing a construction job. They need to be doing their own homework. They're the experts in it, not contracting. They do their market research, and then we compare it to the bids. Now, when it gets to larger acquisitions, a little more complex, and the even the customer doesn't really know what's out there in industry, the government will put out an RFI. And they'll list a bunch of questions. They'll they'll even list, hey, here's our project. We don't know a lot about it. We're relying on you, the experts in the industry, to reply to this RFI. Tell us, A, how would you solve it? And two, if, if we did put this out for an RFQ or RFP, would you be interested in bidding on it? Right? And there's no money involved in an RFI. Right? So... Typically, the market research is, when we talk about it in an independent government estimate, is trying to figure out the ballpark of where the money is going to land, the cost of the, the acquisition. RFIs are really looking for a lot more information. Uh, they're looking for solutions because if, if you think about it, the government really doesn't make anything. They don't do a lot of their own stuff. They have a mission to accomplish. And they're not the experts in the in the in the industry field, right? Because they don't create their own holsters and badges. They don't know anything about it. They don't know how to price it. They're requiring the industry in our country to come up with solutions, right? And that's that's super important because you know I think some of uh, some of my the clients we have here. Uh, they do stuff with adolescents and youth, right? And so different government agencies or even elderly, right? They need to provide youth programs and elderly programs, but they don't necessarily staff the experts in those fields. So it's better if they put out a request saying, hey, you experts in elderly care and infant care, how do we do this? And what are the costs? What are, you know, how do how do we meet our requirement to take care of our, our elderly community, right? Because they just don't staff all the experts and the people working in those fields around the corner. So that's how the government will get information. They'll put out an RFI for you to respond to. All right, I'm gonna, as we don't have questions, We'll put a little placeholder there. Simplified acquisition procedures. If I have a contract information for a procurement officer,
Okay, great question. Um, depending on the agency that you're you're looking for, if at the level now, we can talk federal, but I mean I don't know if specifically federal is where you're where you're headed with your um, with your work. But the federal government has um, small business specialists, right? Okay, well, state and local, they may have them also, just depending on on where you're at. Uh, generally speaking, though, a contracting office, the procurement officer, they're pretty busy, right? And they can take your capability statement, but really they're just coming up with an acquisition strategy of how to get this stuff purchased. They may, depending on the size and the type, go back to their catalog of capability statements, shoot you an email on the side going, hey, we posted this out there. But really what you're looking for is that small business advocate, that small business specialist. And, you know, I'm even uh, for so, so state and local, I would say even your SBA representative, right? You're looking for people who are advocates to the small business, the women-owned small business, local businesses. Get them your information. Make them aware because they're, they're privy to kind of that acquisition landscape that's going on at the current time and within that fiscal year. So you're, you're trying to get that capability statement to those advocates. And then secondly, I get it to a procurement officer if it's the right, and that's hard to explain, if that's the right move, um, which is okay to just send it and, hey, I respectfully offer my capability statement if I can be of service to you. Uh, we're a local woman-owned small business and we specialize in this. Here's our cage code. Uh, you'd like to look us up, but the cage code needs to be on the capability statement anyways. Um, and our website, you know, give them some basic information, that email. A lot of times they'll say, thanks, we'll keep that on record, appreciate it, right? And then you may or may not hear back from them. But again, when you're talking about you want to, you really want to tackle the simplified acquisition piece, then we get into more detailed reverse engineering. We start really looking at where these purchases are happening. Try to understand those state and local agencies that use your services, right? And then we go out and we search for all of the, the end users, right? So the contracting office is really the last person that needs your capability statement. It's your advocates on the top side. And then really the people using your service, the customers. Those are the ones that want to hear from you. You know, they, you know, they're welding every day and it takes them two weeks to get new welding rods. Well, they want to hear you come up and go, I have everything in stock year round. Give us a call. Let your contracting office know what you need and we'll deliver same day. Oh, hey, contracting. Look up this company. See if they're worth anything. They say they have the stuff we need. Okay. You know, the elderly program, those people are going to go to contract and go, hey, we've been talking to a couple providers in the community. They have some really awesome programs. They, they've they told us all about it. They've given us their brochures or capability statement for you. We'd like to look into what they can provide for us, right? So it's that market research or that, that marketing, you know, hitting the street, figuring out who in the government uses what you offer and then getting your information in their hands. Hope that answered that. Does that work? Let's see. So we'll put business ad. Nobody laughed at my spelling. The end user and then the PCO, which is the procurement. 
contracting. Okay. How are we looking? Need at least three companies to compete for one bid. We'll break that question into two pieces. When you read online, the law, the rule, uh, especially when we talk about simplified acquisition, and this is, I'll explain it, it gets a little confusing. It's called the rule of two. The rule of two, so where did three come from? Well, okay, really? It's a rule of three. The law says a rule of two. What government has done uh, for it, and I like she, like Marla said, I've been in this like 30 years. It's, it's back to taxpayer money. Somebody said, yeah, two, but let's go three. And it became kind of an unwritten rule, that rule of three. All right, let's get at least three bids. That way we have high, low, in the middle, we, you know, more competition. Competition does what? It essentially is supposed to drive higher quality, lower price. More competition, the better. If you can get more than three, even better. Now, for those of you that understand a little bit about GSA, and you've heard, hey, you get on GSA and you get tons of work. Well, maybe, maybe not. But GSA is pre-competed contracts. That means they've already gone out and competed against three or more people. Now, when we look at this slide here, it says GSA Advantage. That's a website. You can go to it. It's where the government shops, right? All the contractors are in there with their contracts. It was designed oh, a while back. This is like maybe early 2000s when we really started bringing GSA Advantage online. And for me as a government buyer, I didn't need to do any of these processes anymore. The General Services Administration contracting office already competed the requirement. And they established pricing that is considered, here's another good key phrase for your, your, your Googling pleasure, pleasure is fair and reasonable pricing. The government has to determine your price through some method or form as fair and reasonable. If so, then you can be awarded a contract. GSA did that. They made all this fair and reasonable pricing. I went in as a government buyer. And I said, well, I'm just going to buy this one right here from this company. That worked for a few years. And then the rule of three, this mysterious rule of three, started coming into play that now I had to compare three prices on GSA. So we were sub-competing things that were already had completed the competition cycle. And the reason I tell you that, I mean, there's not a whole lot you can do about it, but understand the government, just because it's written the rule of two all over the place, it's a great question. They're probably gonna be pushing for three or more. And they don't have to have it in writing, that's just what they do. And understand that this in this contracting world, again, it has a creative component to it because as we mentioned up, when we talk about the federal acquisition reg regulation, it, it only restricts us. It only tells us what we cannot do. If we want to compete it with five, then we can do that. It just says a minimum of two. If we want to refine that requirement, make it more stringent, that's how we do it. Bill? Yes. Question. If you're contracted by the government to do an RFI, would you get points toward winning the bid since you were not paid for working on the RFI? No, you will not. And they will explicitly write that uh, in the RFI. They will say that you have no favorable positioning um, through the evaluation process because you have provided this information. And then we'll further say all the information you have provided now becomes property of the U.S. government. 
and thank you. Now let's let's go behind the curtain a little bit. Just don't take that for face value. You want to fill out that RFI and you want to provide your ideas and your solutions because if they like it, you're helping them write their requirement, right? And it's not preferential treatment, but if you like that I produce a rectangle instead of a square, they may put in their requirement, we're looking to buy 50 rectangles. Well, it's just, you know, it's at six degrees of success is when they're doing market research or an RFI, and we do it at Goldwings, this comes down to my, my defense contractor side. When I'm talking to the National Park Service and they go, yeah, we're buying these diesel powered light carts so we can light up an area uh, when we have to do fire prevention. And we say, well, we work in the solar industry. Have you thought about putting the solar light up? Kind of like a lot of us have on our houses or a post, you know, it charges during the day and it shines at night. Well, they don't need the light on during the day. And they're like, oh, that's a great idea. We didn't even think about that. We've been running a diesel power cart and we have to carry a thousand gallons of diesel up a mountain, try solar. Well, then they go, all right, you know what? We're gonna write a requirement and compete amongst everyone solar lighting that puts out so many lumens the batteries last so long right so your rfi and your market research response may help quite honestly develop the government's requirement and it may help develop that requirement right into the sweet spot of what you do so definitely want to keep that communication open but they will not give you a formal uh, preference to to the RFQ if it comes out. And understand too that you, you make a clear point there. Many times a lot of that work, and like we talked about earlier, when you when you're helping divide devise their unknowingly devise their solution, that's resources that you're not getting paid for. Right. And you will there will be no way to make up if you win the contract, you go, hey, remember when I devised the solution? There's no way to recoup those resources that you you put into that. And I'll take it one step further that even let's take the RFI market research off the board. The government came out and said, hey, we're buying rectangles. But then we want to buy them in 411 different painted colors. And you go, oh boy, okay. Now I got to do research. How much does each color of paint cost? How much time is it going to do? And it takes you three weeks to put this proposal together. You put a proposal in and you lose to somebody else. Those are resources you expended on a proposal that you can't recoup. And if you're not doing your proposal writing smartly and you're putting in two proposals a week, every week, how much time and every hour is worth a dollar figure, how much money have you spent putting in proposals that don't win? All right, so I, I'm always gonna I'm always gonna harp on your resources are very important. Think about how you utilize those, um, just because of situations like this where you won't get that money back. Okay, wow, we're doing good. Twelve twenty or twenty after. Do we have more questions? Uh, is there anything else you want me to touch on? Who should you build a relationship with most? Let's see. I would say Marla. That's who. She has resources for financial, business, contracting. They're bringing on taxes. And even though I'm playing around a little bit, the real answer is, and this is an excellent, excellent question. We're gonna put it on here because here's the answer. 
business. This is another foot stomper that I always, always, always put out there. I, I know most of you have seen in your email and you've seen in the regular mail, you get all these advertisements. Hey, we'll do your SAM registration for you. Hey, there's $60 billion in contracts waiting for you. Call us and we'll get you your $60 billion in contract for a fee of $1,200 a year, right? Scratch all those guys. Business development services in Hawaii, for sure, and I imagine in most states, are free. The, the, the government agencies in every state want to build their economy, and you are the foundation of our economy. Every small business out there is our foundation. That's what keeps all of us keeping money moving, right? So business development agencies, like I think Marla put on there, we have your PTAC, your SBA, you got your YWCA that you're already working with, you're experiencing it right now, SBDC, and many, many, many more are free of charge. And PTAC, especially in this arena, that's all they do is contract specific one on one counseling education. Uh, webinars, you know, sit down in an office at a desk, talk story, look at your capability statement, check it, help you with your SAM registration. They have bid match. They'll go out and look for opportunities for you and email it to you every day. MBDA, right? So who should you really build your relationship with? Every one of the counselors available to you that's free of charge. And this isn't just like basic education stuff. I'm talking about SBDC does $100,000 impact studies for companies who are trying to get financing to start a major business free of charge. You've got really smart people in these agencies who have a lot of experience and they have connections in the state. They have connections in the local Department of Defense local educational institutions. These folks are just a wealth of knowledge and resource. Uh, and that's what they love to do. And you don't have to pay them. They're already getting paid. So they're not out there to try to see which company can pay them more. They're there to make you successful. That's their charter. So that, that's where I would head is, you know, find the listing of business development agencies throughout your state in your local community. For us in Hawaii, each island has counselors, you know, and consultants, and we don't charge anything. We're happy to help. And I'll, on an email follow-up, uh, along with the slide deck and our recording, send you contacts for this list and a few others. Yeah, you know, Marley, you, if you can talk to, if you want to expound on that business development agencies and how that how they're available. You know, I've been out of, I, I started the Hawaii PTAC, but I've been out of PTAC for a couple of years. Um, yeah, so yeah. we've mentioned bid match where, you know, we're in the contracting zone here and you would like to kind of get a sense of what matches your NAICS codes. Um, Dre, who just posted the MBDA um, rep, uh, re resource can help with that. They have bid match, Hawaii PTAC also does. What I would encourage you to do is send me an email or give me a call. Uh, I help, my, my main purpose and job is to help you navigate these resources. Um, in general, there's some uniqueness between them and it depends on your situation of the particular challenge you're facing or need you have. And I'd be happy to uh, refer you, take your, your uh, business into consideration and refer you to these resources. But I will include kind of a, generalist uh, as a follow-up to this webinar too. Yeah, they're really great. Uh, I, I enjoyed standing up the Hawaii PTAC. I met so many great clients uh, and I'll tell you that their information is, is solid. Everyone really appreciated what we did for them. Uh, it made us feel good, made us work harder at, at watching you guys succeed. Um, so yeah, we, we love our small businesses.
Okay, Marlo, I think we're about at it. Um, okay, great. Um, do we have any last minute questions or in the last five minute zone? You know, um, I think I want to thank Bill for wrestling a lot of information and taking live questions. It does take us into niche topics. And I think that's great because they're real life, you know, um, questions you have and um, elements to contracting that if we kept it to, you know, a straight subject slideshow, we wouldn't touch on. So thanks everyone for your questions. Um, stay with us on this webinar. You'll have more opportunities to learn from Bill and to ask questions along the way. I'm going to turn it back to Bill just to talk a little bit about what um, he'll be covering on uh, part two. Okay. Yeah, part two, I think we're going to get into more in depth into the, the SAM registration, your NAICS code. We really want to get you set up early with your industry classification and how that changes on a regular basis, uh, how the government speaks a different language than we speak. Even if we are the experts in what we do, for some reason, the government just calls it something different. Uh, capability statements. Um, we'll, we'll get we'll get a little bit deeper into all those next steps of preparing your company. You know, this is, it'll be more homework of really having that a dynamic small business search. Make sure that's ready. Make sure all these pieces are ready, so that we can put that on the side. That your 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 machine is oiled, clean, painted. It's ready to work. Um, and we don't have to go backtrack at the time that we start getting into looking at the meat of contract opportunities. We want your, we, we need your business piece set and ready to run. And um, do start with that capability statement. Am I correct in saying that, Bill? Uh, we had a workshop and it had just a handful of people, though I know there was a lot more that we've worked with that could have benefited from that. <laughs> So um, the lesson here too is it's on you. Take the homework advice and do it because it'll help you take those baby steps towards contracting. So again, I'll post some resources um, in a reply and email to all of you for really working up that capability statement and having, and, and you would be surprised. It takes a little bit. You know, you have to know your NAICS code. You do have to know how to simply um, outline your your capabilities, your business resume, but like we had discussed here, it's an it's really an entry point for you. So um, if you have any questions about that, email me as well and we can set you on your way for that. Yeah, and I, I'm sure next uh, the next event, we'll have a lot more little secrets behind the scenes to how this whole spider web comes together. So look forward to seeing everybody again next time. Thank you all. And with that, we will see you again on December 8th. So have a great Thanksgiving and appreciate you all dialing in from wherever you are across the country. It was a great showing. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. Take Bye. care. Thanks. Thank you.